Hi there, I'm Dan Page and this is a presentation for our CHES 2020 paper that's titled Fennel, an ISC to mitigate analogue microarchitectural leakage. This is joint work with C. Gao, Ben Marshall and Thin Fan and at the time when we wrote the paper we were all at the University of Bristol. So given the time constraints and so on, I'm going to try and focus the presentation at a fairly high level and on the concepts really, rather than the technical detail, which of course you can find in the paper itself. I hope that makes the best use of the time. So as the title suggests, we're interested in information leakage, which is basically the topic that underpins things like side channel attacks. We're not so interested in the attacks themselves, but rather a focus on the underlying source of information leakage and in mitigating that or preventing it in some way. I think it's fair to say that this is a well-established topic by now and one that's probably familiar to the majority of people. The basic idea is that if you have some computation being performed by a target device, then as an attacker, if you monitor this computation going on, the information that you can collect goes beyond the by design API for that computation, so beyond the input and output that's defined, for example. By monitoring the computation, you might, for example, uh, be able to capture the execution time, the power consumption, or the electromagnetic emanation during uh, the computation occurring. The problem, of course, is that if the computation itself is security critical in any way, or involves security critical information at least, then potentially, as an attacker, we gain information about that security critical information, whereas we shouldn't do. So the example on the slide here is that the computation is an AES encryption that involves some key material. By monitoring, for example, the power consumption of our target device, we might learn something about the uh, key material K, whereas the definition of the computation and the API says that we should never do so. Information and leakage itself can be characterised in all sorts of different ways. Um, it depends on the form of leakage, for, for instance. But at the bottom of the slide here, I've tried to uh, write down some ways by which that characterization might be performed. So, for example, the leakage itself might be presented in a scalar or a vector quantity. It might be discrete or analog in nature. You might have to collect it via local or remote means or in a standalone way, or it might require some additional equipment. Collecting the power consumption of our target device, for example, would require, for example, an oscilloscope. So we're particularly interested in analog information leakage that puts us towards the right hand side of my diagram into uh, forms of leakage that include power consumption and electromagnetic emanation. The question of course is really from our perspective if we want to prevent this leakage from occurring we have to understand, understand what the source of the leakage is in the first place. The answer to that question is problematic insofar as it's fair to describe information leakage up to a point as stemming from more or less everywhere. To illustrate that fact, this diagram shows the typical layers of abstraction you might find in a computer system. This is something you might show to a first year computer architecture student, for example. Towards the top of the diagram, it's fair to say that information leakage stems at least in part from the choice of algorithms we make in the first place. Reading from top to bottom then, it also stems from the software we use to implement those algorithms and towards the bottom of the diagram from the hardware platforms that are used to execute that software. From the perspective of this paper, the important layer within the diagram is in the centre, the one labelled Instruction Set Architecture or ISA. The ISA is a fundamentally important computer systems interface that separates hardware from software. It includes a definition of the hardware resources that software can make use of, and also a set of instructions that the software has to actually be comprised of. One way to view the ISA is as some form of contract. So, for example, what it's saying is that as long as the software is written against the interface correctly, then the hardware guarantees that that software will be executed in some well-defined way. As an interface, however, the ISA should be opaque in the sense that although it includes information about uh, instruction execution semantics, so the meaning of instructions, 
It doesn't include any information about how those semantics are actually realised concretely. This decoupling of hardware and software is so important that the paper uh, referenced on the slide here by Dunham and Beard really makes the argument that it's a requirement rather than just a nice property to have. The reason they make this argument is be basically because it allows diversity in the underlying microarchitecture. By having this opaque interface, we're able to implement different microarchitectures to satisfy different market pressures, for instance. We might have one microarchitecture that's uh, for a performance oriented market and a different microarchitecture that's for an embedded market, but they can execute the same software because they both comply with the same ISA. Although this is a compelling argument up to a point, when you look at concrete instances, you can find examples where the ISA is less opaque than you might first imagine. So for example, if you look at concrete instances, concepts such as branch or memory access delay slots or fences already mean that there's some exposure of the underlying microarchitectural implementation to the software that's being executed by that microarchitecture. Once you go down this route, you might wonder whether or not making exactly the opposite argument could also make some sense. That is, making the ISA less opaque and more transparent still. Certainly in some situations it does make perfect sense to do so. And one example would be where you're trying to defend against or mitigate so-called microarchitectural side channel attacks. These sorts of attacks are now 20 years or so old, but in modern terms think about examples such as Meltdown and Spectre. Guy, Yarom and Heiser argue that in order to produce uh, robust mitigations against these sorts of side channel attack, one needs to have a detailed knowledge of and control over the underlying microarchitectural implementation. And so they present a concept called the AISA or augmented ISA, which selectively exposes features in the underlying microarchitecture to the software that's executing on it. On one hand, this means that the ISA is now uh, less opaque or more transparent than it would have been before. And from a traditional computer architecture point of view, this is less than ideal. But they would probably argue that only by doing so are you able to produce robust, secure software. And therefore, the disadvantages are outweighed by the advantages that you then get. We're going to take an approach that follows the same sort of argument and therefore the same sort of concept as the AI sir, but pitched in the context of analog microarchitectural leakage. Following on from that then, I want to give you some more detail and an example of the specific type of problem that we're trying to solve here. So think about trying to mitigate information leakage in a general setting. We're lucky in that sort of setting in the sense that we have a number of techniques available to us that are increasingly well understood. One example of which would be masking. In order to apply a given masking scheme to a given algorithm, the first thing we need to do is change the representation of variables within that algorithm. If you consider a simple first order Boolean masking scheme, the idea would be to take each variable x and split it into two shares, x0 and x1. Whereas with the original algorithm, where an attacker might be able to recover x directly, they are now tasked with recovering both x0 and x1 and then recombining them in order to recover the underlying x. They can't recover anything about x with knowledge of only x0 or x1 alone. Of course, we have to make a corresponding change to the computation involved so that it can be applied to variables in this shared representation. The example on the slide here shows uh, a secure AND operation, and it illustrates both a disadvantage and an advantage. The disadvantage is the computational overhead involved, because what was once a single operation is now up to eight operations in the secure alternative. The advantage, however, that we get from this is that we can reason in a fairly robust way about the security of our secure alternative. For example, we can reason about the non-interaction of the two shares of x, x0 and x1. The fact they don't interact with each other at all within the implementation of our secure AND means that no information should be leaked about the underlying x.
within specific security models and based on specific security assumptions then, we can actually make security proofs about our new masked algorithm that would be impossible otherwise. Clearly this is a big advantage. The problem or challenge then is that a gap exists between that theory and what we see in practice. Or to put it a different way, as soon as we take our masked algorithm and we implement it concretely in software and then execute it on some concrete hardware platform, some of the assumptions that we made originally and would rely on in terms of our security proof maybe don't pan out. What I want to show you is an example that was constructed by Lacour, Groschadl and Dinu in their paper that related to the execution of masked uh, implementations on an ARM Cortex M3 core. This is a processor core that implements the ARM V7M ISA and it does so using a microarchitecture that has a three-stage pipeline. So this is a block diagram of an ARM Cortex M3 core which we're going to use as an example. On the left hand side you can see a set of general purpose registers that we're going to fill with some symbolic variables one of which X is security critical, and so we've uh, used a shared representation. So we have X0 and X1 in registers 3 respectively. On the right hand side, we have a data path that you might expect to see within the microarchitecture, albeit in a fairly simplistic form. What we're going to do is feed instructions into the pipeline and try and reason about how they're executed step by step in the microarchitecture. So the first instruction is an AND instruction. This is fetched from memory and we AND together the content registers 4 and 2 and store the result back into register 6. The instruction progresses along the pipeline through the decode stage and finally into the execute stage and this is where the first problem really starts to crop up. The problem really stems from the fact that the semantics of an AND instruction are such that a barrel shifter will be applied to the second operand before the AND operation itself is applied. That second operand in this case is X0, the zeroth share of our security critical X. Now the way that a typical barrel shifter will be implemented in hardware means that it's plausible we see some interaction between the ith and the jth bits of that second operand. So the ith and jth bits of x0 in this case. And that has three implications. The first is that we're going to observe some information leakage. And that leakage is going to be some function of the ith and jth bits of x0. This is bad, of course, because X0 is security critical, and so we might have expected our masking scheme to have prevented that interaction and therefore the associated information leakage. The second is that one could argue this leakage is an artifact of our microarchitectural design decisions and not our software implementation. For example, it might be plausible to reorganize our data path and thereby prevent the information leakage in the first place. The software would remain the same, but the leakage may or may not exist in either case. Finally, we've got an example here of the gap between theory and practice, because it's unlikely a feature like this would have been modelled in our security proof. So now we've got some information that's potentially useful to an attacker and therefore invalidates our security proof in some sense. The problems don't end there though because the effect of pipelining is such that we've already fetched and decoded a second OR instruction that's going to OR together the contents of registers 5 and 3 and store the result in register 7. Notice that at the moment the pipeline register RB has the contents X0, the zeroth share of our security critical X. When we advance the pipeline, the result will be that we overwrite the contents of pipeline register RB with some new value, and that new value is going to be the second operand of our OR instruction. In this case, that second operand is X1, the first share of our security critical X, and the overwriting operation has the effect of causing information leakage that's uh, the Hamming distance between X0 and X1. As before, this information leakage is really an artifact of our microarchitectural design. The fact that we have a pipeline microarchitecture necessitates this pipeline register. As before, this is catastrophic from a security perspective because now the direct interaction between X0 and X1 means that the attacker likely recovers X in a fairly direct way, in fact.
Keep in mind that it's difficult for software to mitigate this problem, bearing in mind that it stems from a microarchitectural design decision. So the argument is we need a different approach. The approach that we've investigated is called Fennel. And the easiest way to explain what Fennel is and what it does is by analogy, I think. So consider the sequence of instructions shown on the slide here. We're going to divide that sequence into two halves, a green half on the left hand side, which are those instructions before instruction I, and a blue half on the right hand side, which are those instructions after instruction I. Instruction I is a fence or a barrier instruction. And if you take the most general definition possible, the idea of an instruction of this type is that it controls interaction between the left hand side and the right hand side, or the green half and the blue half of our instruction sequence. Instructions of this type can be identified within existing ISAs. For example, they're commonly used to control memory access in some way. For instance, you might want to ensure that any memory access that exists before the fence instruction has completed execution before any memory access after the fence instruction starts execution, thereby synchronizing or ensuring some form of consistency with respect to the memory content. Phrased in this way then, Fennel is basically a fence for leakage. What we want to do is ensure that there's no interaction between instructions before the fence with those after the fence in terms of their information leakage properties. We can use fences of this type in order to solve the problems that we saw previously. The way that we realize this concept concretely is to follow the recommendation of the AI cert by selectively exposing resources in the microarchitecture to the software that's executing on it. More specifically, we add three elements to a baseline ISA. The first element is a configuration register, the ith bit within which maps to a microarchitectural resource or logical grouping thereof. So for example, this could be an individual uh, pipeline register or a group of pipeline registers within a particular stage, for example. The second element are some access instructions that allow the transfer of data between the configuration register and general purpose registers, for example to set the value of the configuration register in the first place. The final element is the fence instruction itself, whose semantics are such that when an instance of the fence instruction reaches execution stage J, each ith resource that exists or is used in stage J is flushed if and only if the ith bit of the configuration register is equal to 1. So basically, when the fence instruction reaches execution stage J, the configuration register decides whether or not a particular microarchitectural resource is flushed or not. Notice that we're a little particular about our terminology here. For example, we use execution stage carefully because the meaning of that might depend on the microarchitecture itself. For example, between a pipelined and non-pipelined microarchitecture. Likewise, we use the term flushed rather than reset because reset has a particular meaning within digital logic often. It means set that value to zero. We might prefer, for instance, to set the value of that microarchitectural resource to some random value rather than zero. Let's re-examine our motivating example with a hypothetical processor call equipped with an implementation of Fennel. You can see that the block diagram for our processor call is the same as before, except for two details. On the left hand side, we've included the Fennel configuration register. And on the right hand side in our data path, we now have an additional input to each one of the multiplexes involved. This additional input labelled row is going to be the value with which we flush each one of the pipeline registers RA and RB in this case. If we start by initialising our general purpose of registers as we did before, we can then move on to fetch, decode and execute instructions. The first instruction that's fetched, decoded and then executed is a write into the Fennel configuration register. This is meant to model setting the bit within the configuration register associated with pipeline register RB. The next instruction to be executed is the AND instruction, and versus the previous example, there's no real difference here. The end result is that we write the value x0 into the pipeline register RB. However, you can see that between the AND and the OR instruction, we've placed a fence instruction, 
This has been placed between the AND and the OR instruction intentionally in order to disallow interaction between those instructions with respect to their information leakage. You can see that having set the Fennel configuration register appropriately, when the fence instruction reaches the execution stage, pipeline register RB is flushed using the value rho. So the previous value of the pipeline register was x0, the new value is rho, and so we observe information leakage that's basically the Hamming distance between x0 and rho. And if the flush semantics that we use mean that the value of rho is random, then the attacker gains no information from this. Crucially, when we execute the OR instruction, basically the same argument applies. The previous value of the pipeline register RB is rho, the new value is x1, so we observe some information leakage that's basically the Hamming distance between rho and x1. Again, the attacker learns no information from this, whereas previously they would have learnt the uh, Hamming distance between x0 and x1, which we argued was uh, catastrophic from a security point of view. So although this is a very specific and somewhat contrived example, what you can see is that we've used this fence instruction when properly configured to control the interaction between execution of instructions with respect to their information leakage. More specifically, we've prevented information leakage that would have been evident otherwise. We developed a prototype implementation of Fennel in two different RISC-V compliant microarchitectures and explored its use in a range of different software workloads. You can find details of this within the paper. Overall, I think it's fair to say that our results are positive in the sense that Fennel as a concept is relatively general purpose. We're able to apply it in different microarchitectures with different sets of microarchitectural resource, for instance. Likewise, the overhead, both in terms of area in hardware and execution latency in software, were relatively low. We were able to use Fennel in various different ways, for example, to localize or find leakage within an implementation, or to reduce or control leakage, and so amplify the quality of existing countermeasures like masking. Having said that, I think it's sensible to view what we've done as a first step rather than a complete solution, because there are plenty of important or interesting next steps that we could take. One example is the study of more complex microarchitectural designs and microarchitectural resources, therefore. Our focus in the paper was on microcontroller class cores, but when you consider, for example, out of order cores, various questions naturally arise. Likewise, we'd like to investigate how to automate or at least semi-automate the placement of fence and configuration instructions in order to reduce the manual effort involved. Okay, so that's it. Obviously, I'd like to encourage you to read the paper for the full technical details, but hopefully this presentation was useful to get across the motivation and the concepts involved. I look forward to answering any questions that you've got at the live session at Chess 2020, but if you can't attend, drop one of us an email using the addresses on the first slide.